This week we're going to be talking about the crucifixion. And again, like with other aspects of this course, because we don't have time to develop all the themes thoroughly, my goal here is to approach each topic from a slightly different direction or emphasize different elements that you may not be getting elsewhere. And in doing that, show both the broader understanding of each theme and also help you think about each theme a little differently. And the cross is one of those important ways I think we need to approach both in its core sense and also rediscover at each point in our lives in different ways. And because it's very easy to lose sight of what the cross was and what the cross is. And if we do that, we lose sight a lot of what Jesus has done we lose sight of who we are and what we need God to do in our lives. Gonzalez writes, The mention of the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate points to the fact that the passion of Jesus took place entirely in the public eye, in the full light of what is historically reliable. So why mention Pontius Pilate by name? We, we don't find that many other details in the Apostles' Creed. Yet it's important because what the Creed is insisting on is that we see the events of Jesus' life within the context of a real and factual history. Jesus wasn't just a religious figure who we have stories about. Jesus was a real man who lived in a certain way, in a public way, who died in a certain way, in a public way, so that even if those who didn't believe in him could say this was a real person, and this happened at this particular moment in time. And so we can look back and say, this is something that is not only a indication of our religious interests, this is an indication of something God actually did in, in actual history. And being an event of actual history, I think it's important to emphasize this element even more. By mentioning Pontius Pilate, the creed is, is saying that Christianity is not a religion of, of mere ethics. It's not this universal cosmic statement of ethereal reality. It's not a philosophical school. It's saying that God works in this world, that God does things in this world, that God has interceded in a particular way. And being a thing in history, we need to sit with this history. Why did God do this thing? Most discussions of the crucifixion jump right to the topic of atonement or justification. They, they will say, okay, it's all well and good this happened. Now, what does it mean? We want to always jump to the meaning. We want to jump to how we explain it or what it's, especially what does it mean for us? And that's all well and good. Jesus did that thing, but what does it mean for me? And in doing that, in jumping too quick past the actual event of the cross, for what it meant in its own time, in its own place, in the context of an actual Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate, ignores the context in history. And in ignoring the context in history, we really miss out on what the intended meaning was for God, for the people of the time. And in doing that, we miss a core element of what it means and continues to mean for us. Because in jumping ahead, the cross becomes spiritualized. It becomes this sort of way of saying that it doesn't really matter if it happened as it is, it just happened and we know God saves us. It becomes a way of talking about how we are freed from our sins. We, we jump to this sort of non-real understanding of Jesus where he had us specifically in mind and we, and we have issues of our sins before him and it just becomes all again, like so much of life about us and about our spiritual state and about our future reality. And we worry about other people's future realities, but not in the context of what actually happened in the first century, in the context of what we think this means in a spiritual sense, not in a physical sense. But the cross was, if nothing else, and there is so much more to the cross, the cross was the absolute epitome of God being involved in a physical way because of the nature of the cross was such a physical confrontation with life and death, such a physical experience. There are few things more physical than the experience of suffering and pain. The, the message, the political message of the cross was an absolute indicator of society and culture at the time. And in jumping ahead to all its spiritual meaning, we really lose out on the core essence of it. And the spiritualizing of the cross leaves open the question question of the cross in particular. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Now don't answer that in a, in a spiritual way. Why specifically this way of dying? Why specifically this event? Why specifically this model? Why did God need the cross? Why did God use the cross? 
why this particular method in this particular moment in this particular place let's look specifically at at how god works in particular context because god is very intentional god doesn't do things haphazardly god doesn't do things sort of w with random ideas there was a very strong intentionality of why jesus came when he did and how jesus died the way he died and it's important for us to look at this so why this way this method this form of sacrifice so the focus that we're going to look at now will be on the historic context of the cross and in looking at the specific historical context we can draw out some theological implications of this event. Issues of atonement and justification, the things that sort of these bigger issues, the what does it mean for us, we're going to talk about that. So I'm not going to ignore that and I'm certainly not dismissing that. The reason we're still talking about the cross and this man who died is because there are issues of atonement and justification that have meaning for people then throughout history and us. So these are important. So we're going to talk about that, but for a minute, I want you to sit with the cross itself. Again, it's not to dismiss those. We're going to focus on elements that are often ignored and elements that provide answers to why the cross was the way of the cross. So we say Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Why did Jesus suffer and die? Well, why Jesus suffered and died goes to really a lot of different questions. And one of the big questions is what kind of salvation do we need? So how the, the reasons Jesus suffered and died point to the, the kinds of salvation we need. And the kinds of salvation we need isn't simplistic. The people of the time in first century Israel needed political salvation. When they thought of the Messiah, they thought of the very clear political issues that had plagued their people in the past, whether it was through Babylon or Assyria or Egypt or so many others, and they saw themselves in the same context under Rome. They were being oppressed by Rome. They were being taxed and overwhelmed. Their religions was, I guess, legally allowed, but they are constantly confronted by pagans and others who were bringing their own false gods and false ways of life into their context and they just didn't know what to do. They didn't have the kind of freedom to worship, to live that they thought God was calling them to. So they needed a kind of political salvation. And we too look for this. How is it that we're able to live in our society in a way that is free, that allows us to be who we feel we're called to be, that allows us to be to express ourselves. So we need a political salvation. We need a moral salvation. In a moral salvation, we do things that are just wrong. We are slaves to our temptation. We are slaves to certain sins. All of us bring to the table different ways in which we can stumble and fall. All of us bring to the bring in our our lives ways in which we are going to break shalom we're going to break the peace between others or god we're going to do things in a lot of ways we, we do things that are right but that we're always under undermined by things that just get in the way and often these things that get in the way become such defining elements that people lose sight of the stuff that we do right and even we lose sight of the things that we're actually providing we lose sight of who we are as we're caught up in all this stuff so we need salvation in living the way life god has called us to live we need social salvation life is full of competition life is full of one person trying to dominate another or dismiss the other i mean this this is indicated from the various early times of childhood i mean think of the social situations of playgrounds the cliques just start compiling pretty early and by high school they're they're pretty solid and they're still there in college the you you cat we categorize people we we put people in boxes we see ourselves as, as certain kinds of people and other people as other kinds of people and see a gap between in a broader sense we see economic, socioeconomic issues causing distinctions between those who are poor and those who are rich, those who are allowed in certain places, those who are not. We see this in how we treat people of other races or people from other countries and how they treat us. We're not the only ones who, who have social distinctions. This is something that every people group in the history of the world have brought to the table in one way or another. There has been social damage in which some people are higher and other people are oppressed you have oppressors you have oppressed you have people in between who are a mix of both we need freedom from this because if life is constant competition and constant attempts at dominance we're always in a state of anxiety about our own status and our own place and our own experiences of oppression we need freedom from this we need spiritual freedom we need to be in communion with god this is a relationship with god and in being in relationship with god we find 
wholeness. We find this true peace. We, tr we find true satisfaction. When we don't have this, we find fears and we find despair and we find ourselves covered in shadow and darkness and we need salvation so that we can truly commune with God and in truly communing with God, we can be whole people ourselves and be whole with others. So we need a holistic salvation. Salvation isn't just about curing our issues of guilt because that's all well and good. We When we, when we seek salvation in Christ and we're saved from our guilt this is this is an important element but we're not yet experiencing the fullness of God's salvation because there are so many parts of our life that are still broken that are still damaged that are still caught up in the chaos of the society and culture around us we're still caught up in all sorts of ways that are trying to define us and other attempts to to give us identity and even those who have been saved find themselves in so many different ways falling back into the traps of slavery and oppression internal and an external if not in official ways it was certainly in ways that are, are, are fundamentally defining for us so we need our whole of our life to find freedom and salvation and when jesus offers salvation it's not a limited compartmentalized salvation that's only meant to address the religious side of ourselves and then leaves the rest of, of our lives to go on its own. When Jesus offers salvation, this is a holistic salvation that is meant to apply to our whole life. And how did he do it? This is the funny thing. If you and I were to devise a way of salvation of providing an answer to people, we probably wouldn't say, let's send our child to go suffer and die for them, and that will fix everything. That doesn't make sense to us if we stop and think about it. Why did God do this method? And it certainly didn't make sense to the dominating cultures of the first century. We have Paul writing that the cross is foolishness to the Greeks and a skill to the Jews. This is in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 31. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Notice in this precisely why God chose the cross. It's foolishness to the Greeks. It's a scandal to the Jews. And that's precisely why God chose it because it doesn't make sense to other people, because it goes against their established structures, it goes against human wisdom of how we are going to earn or establish salvation, how we are going to earn or establish our identity, how we're going to apply ourselves in a way that gives us status in this world, whether we're Greeks or Jews or Americans or whatever we are. We all have systems in which we know this is the game you play in order to find success. This is the way you're going to find hope and renewal. These are the people you have to impress. These are the people you can dismiss. These are the people, this is the, this is the, the, the structure in which you have to fit your life. God says those are not valid ways of giving you identity. Those are not valid ways of giving you salvation. Those are not ways in which you are going to find ultimate peace and ultimate hope. And in order to confront those things in our life, in order to confront those things in this world, God chose a method that completely undermines and goes entirely against the wisdom of the world. And in doing it this way, he says, there is no other way to salvation except through the way that I am going to offer. And this is a way that at its core confronts the other issues of identity and other forms of, of salvation. So that in walking through the cross and finding salvation in the cross, we have no way of boasting of ourselves because the cross is a testimony of emptiness, of loss, of suffering. So that when we find righteousness and sanctification and redemption in this, 
we have nothing in ourselves to boast, but we can only boast in the Lord. For it is in the work of Christ Jesus that we find this hope being furthered. So we look at the trial of Jesus. In the trial, we see several characters, several groups of people, all of whom participated together to bring Jesus to the cross. And it's worth noting each of these different groups of people because in one way or the other, all of us will fall into this category of how we judge ourselves or how we judge other people or how we're trying to establish our own identity. And so as we go through this, this lecture, I'm going to point out these, the, these three types of people as they confronted Jesus, as they led to his crucifixion. The first group we see are, the, are the, a group of people who arrested Jesus in the garden. Who was that? That was the, the, the leaders of the temple. That was, that was the social and religious elites of, of the, the Jewish faith of the time. So Jesus was accused, first of all, by the Jewish leaders. And in his arrest, he was placed before the high priests. He was, he was called to give account to what he said, what he taught. I need to, I need to just because of, of how history has wrongly understood this, emphasize the fact that these were certain Jewish leaders who were elites, who were, who were the power of the time. We can't say that simply because Jesus was arrested by Jew, these, Jew, these particular Jewish leaders that the Jewish people as a whole have some sort of um, guilt. That's wrongly applying the story because you can't separate the, the idea that there's like this whole, that, that these whole group of people are guilty because everyone in the gospels is Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus's followers were Jewish. Both all those who supported Jesus were Jewish. So every the early church was Jewish. So we have to say that there are particular leaders who are responsible for this while other people have to be taken on their own account. We can't like church history has sadly sadly done for so many generations put the blame on the the Jewish people because they were the only ones in the story so you say not that the that the Jewish people were guilty you say these particular religious leaders were guilty that these particular religious leaders these particular religious participants were representing something in their era that continues to be represented and oftentimes by the people who have used this story to persecute the Jews because we have the same kind of religious leaders throughout history using their power to dominate and control others, to define people through these religious means. Jesus was accused as a blasphemer. So what does that mean? Jesus, in, in religious terms, we say that Jesus was guilty because he said he was God. That's what they charged him with which was a huge charge for the Jewish leaders of the time, some of which were certainly seeking their own benefit and seeking their own power, others of which were genuinely concerned that Jesus was going to what was a false prophet. You had you had both the genuinely zealous and the falsely mixed in with this, as still happens in, in churches throughout history and today. The Old Testament is full of stories of how the people of Israel forsook God and went away from God and followed false idols and false prophets to their own damage and shame. And so there was a genuine worry that when Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, that when Jesus claimed to be God, he was actually going to bring judgment upon the people of Israel because that's what happened before. And so they were very intent to make sure that Jesus did not, one, upset their own power structure and two, upset the religious structure that could actually cause God to get angry at Israel once again. So, so again, there's a mix of motives here, both genuine and both and selfish. So Jesus was charged as a blasphemer. Deuteronomy 21:23 says, "Anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse." So two elements of cursing that are reflected in the cross. We have the blasphemer who is using God's name in vain, essentially, and we have the method of the cross going especially to the idea that by being hung on a cross, God, Jesus was under God's curse. And so in accusing him, in Jesus not defending himself, in Jesus's way of death, the religious leaders were shown to be essentially right. They thought they were right. Jesus was not who he said he was, it seemed. They saw Jesus as one who was cursed, who was rightfully killed. His teaching and ministry intentionally steered people away from the controlling authority of the religious leaders. That's a big reason why they were intentional about testing him. Is he who he says he was? And more than that, he intentionally included and participated with those whom the religious law itself excluded. Jesus undermined the religious structure. 
Jesus undermined the idea that these religious leaders were the ultimate authorities on issues related to people's spirituality. He undermined the idea that these people could say what you could and couldn't do, what you should and shouldn't be, what you, where you had to be at a certain time and place. And more than that, he went purposely against them by associating with the kinds of people the law itself were unclean. The religious law, this wasn't the religious leaders, this was the testimony of scripture that said you cannot associate with these people and then be yourself holy. These are people who are cursed, whether it's the lepers or the suffer the, the people who are broken in their bodies, the, the handicapped, the, the women who um, have done certain things. All these things are ways in which society was controlled and understood in the context of the law, giving certain people authority, giving certain people power. The religious leaders certainly adopted and utilized this power for their own gain, but a lot of this structure was in the Old Testament itself, and so they weren't going against the Old Testament. The, the key issue here is that Jesus himself held to high ethical standards, exceeding that of the law, so they couldn't come and say, you're doing... Who are you to talk about this religious stuff? Who are you to redefine what we're talking about because you're doing all these bad things? He lived an exemplary life in every way, following the law, fulfilling the law, doing all this stuff that he that that's that just pushed against their trying to bring any other accusation or undermine his authority. That's why he was so dangerous. He exceeded what they were doing and then he confronted them with their authority. He 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 fulfilled the law to its utmost and then said this isn't enough this isn't provide that you're not getting it you're not getting what you actually need you're not getting how we're called to associate with other people so in being accused by other people he didn't align himself with the power structures he didn't align himself with those who were at the top of the chain he didn't in his perfection didn't then cling to all the other great people he didn't in his popularity join the popular groups he didn't in his in his uh, spiritual depth align himself with the places of a clear wisdom and authority. Instead, he chose to participate with those whom re religious leaders opposed. And in doing that, he undermined their role as leaders. By participating with, their, with those who were religiously excluded, Jesus asserts the will of God against those who would serve as a gatekeeper. The religious leaders were giving structure to their society and their religion, and by participating with people who the religious leaders were said were outcasts and not to be as associated with the people that they said were cursed and under the judgment of God, Jesus completely breaks apart any sense that the religious leaders actually had the role of saying who God values and who God despises. And so Jesus in the trial and on the in the in the cross offers this ultimate confrontation. Who speaks for God? Does Jesus speak for God or do these religious leaders speak for God? Again, Jesus associated with those who are cursed and seemingly under God's judgment, the oppressed, the left out, the left behind. Jesus himself was accused as a blasphemer and under the curse. Jesus's method of dying was a way of saying God's curse is upon this person. So do you have this person who was cursed and associated with all the unclean? Is this the person that speaks for God? Or is it the religious leaders who are following the template of the Old Testament law itself and who have this hereditary role as priests and high priests and have been given this role of speaking for God. Do they speak for God? Jesus confronts them. He confronts them with who speaks for God, the cursed man, the broken man, the suffering man, or these religious leaders. Who speaks for God? That's the first confrontation of the cross. Who gets to speak for God? We move on. Trial with the Jewish leaders was not the whole story leading to the crucifixion, as we well know. And so we can't limit the focus on the Jewish leaders. We can't say this is just purely an issue about their role or their ideals or their conflict with Jesus. We also note, as the Creed notes, that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. So not only was he put on trial, the trial itself became very quickly focused to the idea that this was going well beyond the Jewish issues. It led to fierce opposition against Jesus with, with the Jewish trial, but it was not the direct reason for his crucifixion. If Jesus was uh, convicted in, in this Jewish 
trial and they followed the path that was ascribed by the law, Jesus would have been stoned. A blasphemers were, as the law intended, stoned. Jesus was, as we all know, not stoned. His crucifixion was an act of the controlling legal authority of the time, the Roman Empire. Why? Well, Jesus was seen as someone who, if not entirely himself a rebel, at least contributed to fomenting social disorder and so could be blamed as a social agitator. So what was Rome's issue in this? They, could, they didn't care about the religious stuff. They didn't care if he was a blasphemer. Rome had, had many people in all sorts of different places, all claiming all sorts of things, most of whom weren't killed. What caused Rome to apply its power? Well, it's when someone seemed to set themselves up as a competitor to Rome, or someone who other people might see as a competitor to Rome, someone who was challenging their authority, someone who was challenging what they saw as social order. So when Rome steps in, it's they're saying, is this person a threat to the social order we have in Judea now? And he was. So we, we, we see the idea that for Rome, their control over the Jewish lands was extremely tenuous. There were constant rebellions. There were constant claimants to being uh, Messiah. Jesus wasn't the first to say he was Messiah and wasn't the last. Um, and so we have all throughout this, this time a real and present danger of active rebellion by the Jewish people against the Roman rulers. They did not like Rome. They did not want Rome there for all sorts of reasons. So Rome was extremely cautious. And Rome's method of responding to such problems was to take immediate and absolute forceful action. They destroyed things that were causing problems. We, we see this, um, and a great example of this was happened not far from where Jesus grew up. The, <coughs> the town of Sepphoris, which is not too far from Nazareth, was in the years preceding Jesus, a Jewish stronghold. It was primarily a Jewish city. It was filled with people who, who were well-educated and very politically involved. And it was a source of some people who sought to rebel against Rome, who pushed back against Jewish authority. So what, what did Rome do? Rome sent in a legion. Rome sent in a legion of, of Roman soldiers with various militia <coughs> of other kinds. And they went into the town. They, they sacked it. They took it over. They destroyed the whole town. They said, if this is a place that, that allows for rebellious actions, we are going to destroy the whole thing. So they razed the city. They tore it down. They razed with an R-A-Z-E-D, not raise it again, but they did raise it again. They, they, they tore it down and then they rebuilt it. They rebuilt the city and then wouldn't allow any Jewish people in it at all. It became a Jewish stronghold and turned into a Gentile stronghold. Some people would argue that a carpenter like Joseph, who was also maybe a, a stone worker and, and it also a general craftsman, would have had a lot of opportunity and work precisely in, in Nazareth, suggesting there was a reason they moved back, precisely because Sepphoris needed to be rebuilt. Rome was brutal, and we don't have enough time to talk about the brutal nature of Roman response to those who they thought were threats. Absolutely brutal. Brutal in a way that not only sought to prevent the problem, brutal in a way that sought to dehumanize the problem, undermine any source, destroy every remnant of it. They issued absolute authority over the people, and as the people pushed back, Rome responded by asserting its authority again. So Jesus, was then seen in the context as someone who was creating disorder. Even if he himself was not the source of this, even if he wasn't making claims and intentionally saying, I am uh, going to lead an army against Rome, he was causing people in Jerusalem and elsewhere to get angry, to, ha to have mobs. There were mobs being formed and any kind of mob, any kind of social disorder was for Rome a very dangerous sign. So they didn't care about the issue, but neither did they care about particular people. So if there was a problem, the easiest thing to do would be just to get rid of it, right? And Jesus was a problem. Jesus didn't see Rome's response as defeat, and he didn't see Rome as establishing true peace. So we, we have Jesus in a curious situation. Jesus was taken to trial before Pilate. Jesus had not, we know from the, the testimony of the Gospels, sought to establish his kingdom immediately in in purposeful militaristic overthrowing of Rome. But yet he was, we might argue, a little ambivalent about Rome. 
even if he didn't see himself as leading an army to take over, near, nor did he really recognize Rome as the authority it thought it was. Jesus did not see Rome as being able to define him. Just as he did not see religious leaders able to define him and give him meaning and purpose, so too Rome wasn't able to define him. Jesus then saw Rome's response not as a way of them asserting themselves over him, and he also didn't see that their peace was true peace. He, he simply did not see the Roman Empire as being the answer to any of humanity's real problem. So he willingly submitted himself. That is the key issue in, in understanding what happened with, with Rome. Jesus did not push back against the Jewish leaders handing him over. He didn't, he didn't make a case for himself before Pilate and, and pit himself against the Jewish leaders in light of Rome's authority. He could have. See, the part of the problem with Pilate was Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus didn't respond. Jesus didn't try to argue on his behalf. He didn't see Pilate as the abil as ability to judge. Even if he disagreed with the Roman leaders, he didn't see that Pilate had any authority to gauge the issue whatsoever. And so, in submitting himself, he went through the process, but he went through a process in a way that neither confronted directly the Rome's empire in the way that Rome would acknowledge its own power to judge, nor did he entirely accept Rome's power as ability to judge. He simply followed the process where he was led, did not argue, did not try to contend for or against anyone. He just was there in the process. So Rome sentenced Jesus to death. Again, Rome is the one who actually sentenced Jesus to death and a particular kind of death. Jesus re refused to participate in the Roman system of justice. He showed up, he didn't offer a defense. So Rome, in trying to assert its absolute authority and give peace, said the easiest thing for us to do would be to kill this guy that will rid us of the problem. We see we see uh, these kind of issues even still. I mean, think of, of the last year and all the riots we've seen in Egypt or Libya or all the things we still see in, in Israel and the Palestinian territories today. All these riots in which you have people who, some of whom are on the ruling side, many of whom are on the oppressed side, there are these riots that very well might lead to the overthrow of the established rulers. And so, as in Egypt, as in Libya, the established rulers will do whatever they have to do to, to prevent that. We see this continuing in Syria, how you have a group of rebels protesting against rule and you have this dictator who just will not allow that and does these absolutely brutal things to prevent that. So, Rome was wanting to avoid the same kind of things we're seeing even today. Jesus, again, in protesting their actual authority over him, refused to stay dead, which is an act of ultimate rebellion, because if Rome was asserting its power, if Rome was saying, we are the defining authority, we are the ones who are in charge, and we say you will die, that is an act, of, that is an expression of its total power over life and death. That is an expression that even if you disagree with us, we still control you. Well, Jesus refused to stay dead. Jesus refused to acknowledge their power either in their trial or in, in their sentence. Jesus said, you have no power over me whatsoever. So in this, he contrasted himself with Rome's authority. He didn't feel Rome had a place to judge him between him and the religious authorities. He didn't feel Rome, he had to justify himself to Rome. And in this, in this contrast with him and Rome, which wasn't again a military contrast, it was a question of abs who was actually in charge. He also contrasted his teaching with Rome's policy. His way of the kingdom, his way of, of finding identity and meaning was different than what Rome said. So Jesus was crucified. Jesus was killed as a violator of what's called Pax Romana. Pax Romana was, is just the Latin phrase meaning peace of Rome. And the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, was a thing that's, that Rome said was offering the world. They thought themselves the enlightened ones. They thought them a, themselves able to bring together diverse peoples and diverse settings and bring them into this common people group. And they argued that Pax Romana was a gift to the world. This is peace. They were offering a real and present peace to the world. And if you, if you push back against that, they thought themselves extremely validated to quote that because Anyone who pushed against Pax Romana was inciting war, was inciting violence, so don't do that. And if you do that, we're going to stop you. The cross, then, is a declaration of a different kind. Of. The cross is a declaration of what could be called Pax Christi, the peace of Christ. What is the way of peace that Jesus pursued? 
He confronted Rome, but he didn't confront Rome through Rome's methods, through Rome's tactics, through putting himself as an alternative to Rome. He confronted Rome by entirely rejecting their very ability to pronounce judgment on him. He rejected their entire, the entire structure of what they saw as meaning and purpose and value. He didn't just confront them and say he's more powerful. He confronted the very essence of what they thought they were doing, something that has been defined by empires before Rome and has been defined by empires since Rome. It's a different way of peace. It's saying the pursuit of peace is not through application of violence against other people. The pursuit of peace is through being willing to completely dismiss the very value judgments and the <coughs> very characterizations that cause all the problems to begin with. The way of Jesus, the way of the cross, this peace of Christ was a way of deeper peace, not through active rebellion, but through substantive refutation of Rome's very ability to assert itself. You get this. This is, this is huge. What, in the trial with Pilate, Jesus, by not answering anything, was confronting Rome's very ability to be a judge over anyone. Jesus did not accept Rome's rule over him. And instead of pushing that against that, instead of being a violent rebel, instead of playing the same game, just with different, with, with different sides, Jesus refused to play the ga he, game at all. He didn't even acknowledge that was the game to play. Rome, for him, was not the answer. And the answer wasn't to replace Rome with another empire or another set of people who tried to do the same thing. His answer was to offer an entirely different method of peace. And to do that, he had to confront Rome. Because what Rome thought was that it spoke for the world. Who speaks for this world? Who speaks for power, for advancement, for civilization? Who speaks for what it means to have peace in this world? Who speaks for the way that society should function? Rome says we do. And Rome said that in a way that was pretty convincing since they took over much of the world around them. They proved seemingly that they were the dominant people to speak for the world, that they, they were the advanced people. The cross confronts that. Jesus says he speaks for the world and the way of peace is the way of the cross. So who speaks for the world? Jesus confronts the ultimate power of his time in this question. And there's, there's no middle ground here. There's the way of Rome or the way of Christ, two completely different options. So we have Jesus being also rejected by Jewish radicals. We see this in, towards the, uh, not the end, but, but there's a certain part of, of the story of Jesus where, where Pilate says, um, I don't have anything against you. I, I don't have anything that, that I'm, I can charge you with, yet we need to do something. Here's what I'm going to do, Pilate says. I'm going to, let, I'm going to completely dodge making a decision because it seems like no matter what I do, things are going to get bad. So I'm going to offer the people a choice. They, the, the tradition of the time was that Pilate, the, the governor, could release one person a year. They were, they were pardoned. They were given back. So, so, Pi, so Pilate says, I am going to offer the people a choice. They can pick Jesus, who offers one way, one, one method, one approach, who seems to be a popular and influential teacher, or there's this other guy named Barabbas. Now, Barabbas is interesting. A lot of scholars now don't think he was a common criminal, as might be implied, but that he was more what could be called a bandit and a bandit in Robin Hood kind of terms, in that he was a zealot, he was a political activist, he was, in modern terminology, a terrorist. He was someone who had been captured by Rome and had applied violence and committed crimes in the pursuit of Jewish independence from Rome. Jesus, however, refused to do that. Jesus refused to take up this mantle of leadership that would lead an army or lead people into this clear overthrow of the Roman Empire, which is what the people expected of the Messiah. So for the zealots, for these political ra radicals of the time, Jesus wasn't political enough. He was too political for Rome, but he wasn't political enough for the radicals. And as it contained social and political elements, the teaching of Jesus would certainly have resonated with the zealots, the Jewish men and re women who actively sought political and social liberation. Jesus, in re going a completely different way, of Rome was arguing for liberation of the people and was seemingly pointing towards ways in which 
the Israel was supposed to come back and do its own, that God was offering salvation, that there was going to be a change in the social and political status of, of people and places. Of course this would have resonated. They saw Jesus as maybe someone who, a, a, a charismatic figure who could become a public leader, who could lead the people into actively overthrowing Rome so that religious movement could start again. Whereas the Pharisees sought this religious reformation, which is the right orientation towards God in spiritual and religious matters, the zealots sought the activism of God, the assertion of the right to rule and have political freedom, to throw off the yoke of their oppressors, a political zeal for liberation. And so in the same way, um, the zealots sort of, sort of tracked with a different part of Jesus. Jesus was appealing to the Pharisees because he was seemingly this great religious and wise religious leader. But he turned this leadership in a direction away from what the Pharisees were wanting to do. And in the same way, Jesus was offering a very strong political and social commentary of his time. But he was turning this a different way than what the zealots wanted to do with it. Like the zealots, Jürgen Moltmann writes, Jesus broke with the status quo and those who maintained it into being. So the similarities of Jesus with the Pharisees brought their initial acclaim and later their reprobation. The Pharisees hated Jesus precisely because he was so close to them and didn't pursue his cause, he was a danger to them. So same way with the zealots, they, he was awakened to them as a, as a possibility of leader, but infuriates them when he didn't want to make this a political uh, movement against an act, in an active rebellion against Rome. Jesus was so close to the zealots that they thought him a possibility, and when he, when he did not finally go the way they wanted, they had to kill him because he, in being so close, he was getting the, in the way of them pursuing the method that they thought was, was, was true. So Jesus was the friend of sinners. That was the problem, which alienated the Pharisees. Being a friend of the sinners meant that he wasn't pursuing the same kind of religious goals, defining purity in a certain way as the Pharisees. And he was a friend of tax collectors, which alienated the zealots because he wasn't being true to his people. He wasn't fighting against the so-called traitors or the people that were undermining society. Jesus was a problem. Being a friend of sinners and tax collectors alienated the movements of his time, and he needed to be stopped. So when Pilate sought a way out of his predicament and offered to release a prisoner, the people chose Barabbas rather than Jesus, and in doing that, they made a claim for who they felt was more valuable. They felt the zealots, the bandits, the people who were arguing for an active military overthrow of Rome through whatever means possible was the way of peace. They rejected that Jesus was the way of peace. But who speaks for the people? Not all the people agreed with the zealots. Jesus had his own followers. The zealots thought they were speaking for the people. The zealots thought that in pursuing this overthrow that they were going to offer social and political liberation to the oppressed people of Israel, to the people who had been burdened by the taxes and military and religion of Rome. They thought all this stuff they were doing was to help the people move forward. As so many political revolutions since then have done, they've said, we are doing this for the poor. We are doing this to, to help those underclasses. And all too often we see throughout history that once these revolutions happen, it's not necessarily a ultimate help to the poor. It's that it's just the people in power change names. And so political means of revolution that the zealots sought was validated in effect a lot of the same claims of Rome. The zealots just wanted to be the ones in charge. And we see that in the whole history of Israel before the time of Jesus in the Maccabean revolution, where you had a religious overthrow of the oppressor then, which soon, barely soon, within generations, led to a new oppressive class of ruling parties who were, were just as wicked as anyone who came before. Power corrupts, ultimate power corrupts ultimately. And even if people say they speak for the people, it becomes very clear that if you're playing the same game, you're not actually on the side of the people. But who speaks for the people? Who actually is going to bring help to those who are oppressed? Who is actually going to bring freedom for those who are enslaved? Who is actually going to bring renewal? Who gets to speak for the people who don't have a voice? The zealots said they did by, by their actions. Jesus confronted the zealots by saying their way was not his way, but he's the one who was going to offer real freedom. So who speaks for the people? Jesus was not a good citizen of Rome, nor could we say a good citizen of Israel. Jesus was a citizen of the kingdom of God. And inasmuch as this confronted and conflicted with the established patterns of Rome or the religious leaders of Israel or the zealots, Jesus was seen as a danger. 
he rebelled against assertions of power in, a res in his resistance to domination. To both assertions of power, whether it's religious or whether it's political, whatever side the politics are on. And in being a citizen of the kingdom of God, he offered an alternative kingdom. Not one that was in absolute contrast to what was happening, one that didn't even validate these as being ways of actually determining authority or ultimate power. So there, are t Jesus very much in his the time of his ministry seemingly was able to walk a fine line, which is why he was so often confronted by Pharisee people on both sides that wanted him to take sides. Who, should we pay taxes? Um, Jesus was asked, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. Jesus was not playing the game. Jesus offered an absolute alternative. He was not the Messiah Rome could fear. Rome didn't fear this Messiah, but he was also not the Messiah the zealous wanted. And so no one knew what to do with him, and no one wanted him. Rome couldn't fear him, but they, he was causing problems, so they had to kill him. The zealots couldn't do anything with him, so they, they would rather have someone who actually took action. Who speaks for the mission of God? If the mission of God is to offer and bring into being this kingdom, is to bring into reality the kingdom and, and enact the will of God in all ways, who gets to speak for the mission of God? Rome thought they were, were the bearers of the mission of God. Caesar was seen as a deity who was worshipped, called Lord. Caesar is Lord was, was the defining statement of the time. The zealots and the Jewish leaders said, no, you don't speak for God. We speak for God. We speak for God as the religious representatives of this Jewish law that had enacted the temple. We speak for, for God as part of the people of God who are wanting to establish the promised land as ours again. Jesus offered a different way. Jesus offered a way that could not go hand in hand with these other methods because they were all defining themselves absolutely. Who speaks for the mission of God? Who speaks for the kingdom, <coughs> the kingdom of God? Is it Rome? Is it the zealots? Is it the religious leaders? Who speaks for the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God like? How does the king, is the kingdom pursued in the mission of God? Who gets to define this? Who's in charge? Who speaks for the mission of God? Is it Caesar? Is it the Jewish leaders? Is it Josephus? Josephus is a uh, general of uh, the Jewish armies that sought to actively rebel against Rome in the decades after Jesus' death. The, there was a major rebellion in the late 60s AD, and Josephus was in charge of that. So Josephus here is this image of ultimate rebellion trying to define the political cause over and against. Josephus has an interesting story. We won't get into that now, but look him up. He's a curious figure. All three of those thought, said they spoke for the mission of God. Who speaks for the kingdom of God? So we have these four images, the great Caesar, the powerful religious leaders, the genius general, and the dead man on the cross. Who speaks for the mission of God? Who speaks for the kingdom of God? Foolishness and a scandal to say it's this picture at the bottom. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. An image, not quite a sidetrack, but an interesting image as we continue to ask why the cross comes from Numbers 21, four through eight. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it. Make a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Interesting. Jesus, who is cursed by hanging on a tree, as we gaze upon this figure, we find salvation. More than gaze. As we see in this figure the confrontations that he sought against the world, and also the confrontations that we're feeling in our own lives. We're given a choice. Do we make our own way, or do we follow the way that God has intended? There's no middle ground again. Why would putting a poisonous serpent and setting it on a pole be the answer to people's illnesses? It's foolishness. It's scandalous. That's what God did. We've talked about the meaning of the crucifixion and its form of confrontation and its form of confrontation with three key figures who really represent a broad path of, 
uh, approaches to life, the religious leaders, the zealots, the Ro and Rome. But what itself was the crucifixion? It's helpful, even if a little disturbing, to look actually what happened. What was this process? We know this story, we know the events, and yet we don't know exactly really always specifically what happened. So it's, it's interesting to learn more. And here's a video that tells us a little bit more about what crucifixion, what this process was actually like physically. Yeah, I, I believe that Christ's suffering uh, and the demonstration of the kind of um, a physiologic stress that his human body was under uh, is manifested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it's described that he was sweating blood. And there are there is a well-documented uh, medical condition in which patients who are under tremendous amount of uh, emotional stress and physiological stress can in fact uh, sweat blood because little blood vessels within the glands burst and, the, and then the blood is expressed. The, the, the scourge involved the use of a, a short whip with pieces of uh, typically metal, sometimes bone, sometimes pieces of porcelain wrapped in these leather straps, which is then utilized to, to come across uh, typically the back, the shoulders, the legs of the victim. Uh, and uh, the first few passes across a particular body part would tear through the skin, the fat, uh, but eventually, once the outer layers were, were uh, torn away, it would start getting in the muscle and the tendon. And of course, along the way, you're ripping through all the blood vessels that supply all those tissues. And so you're losing blood the whole time. The plant that was described um, uh, actually had a very long thorn, um, not the little thorns that we would think from a rose bush. These were thorns that were uh, typically an inch and a half to two inches in length. The scalp is one of the most vascular portions of our body. It's got a huge blood supply up there. So then having those thorns shoved down into the, you know, down onto the bony plate would have gone through all the scalp which in and of itself would have created a huge amount of blood loss. Uh, I've seen people actually bleed to death from just the scalp injury. So uh, this is not a small injury to have, uh, who knows, dozens uh, of these things shoved into your scalp. And so that would have caused more blood loss. Typically when a victim has to uh, uh, carry the cross, what has been described uh, in the literature, in, in actual Roman literature, is they, they describe, the, they, they carry the crossbar. Uh, and the crossbar is estimated alone, was estimated to weigh about 110 pounds. And of course, if your arms are stuck out here, wrapped up on the cross, crossbar, and you fall down, you need help getting up. You, you, you just can't get up on your own because there's no possible way without your arms to get up. So he would have needed help getting up. If he, fall, if he fell over, there's a good chance that he could have hit his chest, which, which then could account for the possibility of a cardiac injury. Anatomically, we consider the wrists as part of the hand. And so uh, with the placement of the nails between the radius and the ulna at that position, it, it still fits, fits the definition of being in the hand and it's in a position in which the nail won't rip out, which you have to have, you have, to have a solid point of fixation. Uh, another interesting point about the placement of that is the median nerve goes right straight through that particular uh, 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 portion of the wrist. And so there would have been uh, either destruction of the nerve or, or impingement of the nerve that would have created a tremendous amount of pain so that every time you try to take a breath, you'd be, it'd be agonizing. You'd be pushing down on spiked feet which of course hurt, and then you'd be hanging on spiked arms. And so you alternate from excruciating pain to excruciating pain every time you take a breath. So, so even if he survives the actual crucifixion, he would have had to survive what I believe to be a, a, a lethal injury from the spear just to find out whether he was alive or not. What's described is the loss of water and blood and that would entail either the, the uh, uh, either a pleural effusion or pericardial effusion, and the blood would have come from either pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, the aorta or vena cava, or the heart itself. 
None of those injuries, unless you're treated immediately by a trauma surgeon like myself, with all the advanced equipment that we have, would be survivable after even a few minutes. Christ, as the Son of God, could have survived anything. He chose to manifest himself as a human at that point in time and allowed himself to die. And, and being human at that point in time, he could not have survived this particular series of traumas. It's not possible. Um, Christ as God could have survived anything they threw at him. And, but he chose to be Christ, the human, at that point in time to die for our sins. And that given that, that self-limitation of remaining to be human, he died. He did not survive the event. In posting that video, I'm not just giving it just for the trivial details or to sort of emphasize. I want to emphasize that the cross was much more than capital punishment. If you're just killing someone, there are a lot of ways to go about it. And Roman citizens, for instance, were beheaded, which is obviously not an ideal event, but it's considered relatively quick and painless because it's just so instant. It's just a way of killing. Other ways were poison, or, or ways in which um, there was more honor or immediacy. As we see here, the issue with the cross was that it was more than just a capital punishment. It was to intended not only to kill someone, that was its ultimate goal, but there are a lot of other goals with it. It also intended to dehumanize the victim. It took away not only their life, it took away their very humanity. By so attacking the physical body at its core, it was an absolute assertion that that person wasn't even human because you wouldn't treat someone you think of as human in such a way. So for Rome, the cross was a, was a dehumanizing. It was a complete rejection of their very status as a human, as a, as a being of any worth at, at all, treated worse than animals who, who were being butchered. And again, as we noted before, it was also more than death for the Jewish leaders and for the Jewish religion. It was a way of showing that a person is cursed, not only die, but in fact rejected by God. Again, dehumanizing the victim, saying this person has been rejected by God in this manner of death. So Jesus was more than just killed. He was confronted by the Jewish leaders. He was confronted by Rome. He was confronted by the zealots with this form of execution that meant to assert absolutely that Jesus was not someone to be followed or listened to. That Jesus not only was not the Messiah, he wasn't even a person. So the Jewish leaders in Rome and the zealots pushed back against Jesus' confrontation and pushed back in an ultimate way that resulted in the absolute suffering of Jesus. And because Jesus didn't defend himself, because Jesus went willingly, this was the path that he chose in his own confrontation. They thought they were winning. This was the path Jesus chose to show them that he did not win. There's some themes that we see arising from this particular issue of the cross. Why the cross in particular? Again, there are a lot of spiritual issues of relating to atonement and spiritual issues relating to to what this means for us and we're not focused on those at, at, at right now we're focused on why the cross in particular what did the cross mean in the time and what does it continue to mean for us as we uh, as we participate in this cross in a holistic sense well some themes that arise some at the core of the cross is one of confrontation who gets to define reality Jesus argued that he defined reality, that he's speaking for God, that he is speaking for the people, that he is speaking for the mission of God. The Jewish leaders, Rome, the Zealots, they all argued against him. They said, no, we speak for this world, we speak for the people, we speak for God. And in the confrontation, one side had to be shown right and who was right and who was wrong. And in the crucifixion, it was seemingly assured that the confrontation went against Jesus, that Jesus was wrong. On the cross, the Jewish leaders knew they were right. On the cross, Rome asserted it was right. On the cross, the zealots were confirmed that they picked the right person. Who gets to define reality? The cross also is a great instance of the Trinity. For me, at least, 
the cross is the instance which pushes me to say, yes, we have to come to terms with the Trinity. There are a lot of other ways and forms and kinds of theology that might explain other parts of Scripture. We can look at the, the, the way the three names are used and fall into some modalism or other pattern of thought. <coughs> but the Trinity doesn't let us. The Trinity pushes us to what has become I, the, the orthodox position, the idea that there are three persons here. God is one, but we see the Son doing something on the cross. We see the Father interacting with the Son in one way. We see the Spirit being given up. All three of these persons who are representing God are doing something different. And so the cross becomes this prism. All this one, this one God we see in three different movements and three different persons in a way that can't really allow us to see this one God and as a simple unity. Otherwise, we would have to dismiss the divinity of Jesus or the Holy Spirit altogether, which is an, which is, brings with it its own problems. Death, God himself, enters into and experiences death. Death is real. The cross is a real death of Jesus. And by death, it's not this temporary or illusion form. Jesus was dead and truly dead. The cross brings to the forefront this ultimate confrontation, not only with Rome, not only with the religious leaders, not only with the zealots, but with the ultimate power we all of us that all of us have to face, and that of death. This is the ultimate confrontation, and Jesus openly and willingly confronted this as well. And again, seemingly lost the confrontation with death. Jesus was buried. Jesus didn't just sit on the cross, experience all the pain of the cross, then open his eyes and jump off and put everything to right. The story was over for the disciples, it seemed. The story of Jesus's ministry had come to an end, it seemed, for his family and others around, for Rome, for the religious leaders. They thought this is done. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. The work of God had been accomplished. But how so? Jesus was buried. It is finished. What does that mean? And yet that is the meaning of the crucifixion, that something happened, some ultimate kind of confrontation, some kind of ultimate victory, was that even when Jesus was buried, we say, this, is, this work has been finished. We know this isn't the end, but for now, let us sit with the idea that this is the end and it is finished. And the fact that Jesus is buried was, was sort of the final testament of the confrontation. Who won? Who was right? Who speaks for God? Who speaks for the mission of God? Who speaks for the people? A theology of the cross is the ultimate story of conflict between one approach of peace versus another approach of peace. We have the Pax Romana versus the Pax Christi. The peace of Rome in contrast to the peace of Christ. The peace of Rome is something that's represented not just by Rome but by human societies and powers in small empire-sized ways or in sm much smaller family-sized or among friends. We have ways of keeping the peace that is through dominance and control and mastery, or we have ways of keep or finding peace that is way, the way of hope, of sacrifice, of a holistic peace for everyone. Jesus' goal was much more than temporary peace through temporary forms of apparent peace through domination. His goal was not the goal of Rome. Rome thought a momentary, sought a momentary peace through domination. Pax Romana thus came about through the application of crucifixion. How do we keep the peace now? How do we address each instance of problems as they arise? What do we do when someone tries to break this peace? We we confront them, we stop them, and we kill them in a dehumanizing fashion if necessary. Pax Christi, the peace of Christ, however, comes about through the reception of crucifixion. How did Jesus bring peace? He didn't confront Rome or the religious leaders or the zealots in the means that they thought were the, the, the means to pursue. He didn't confront them on their own terms. And in not confronting on their own, them on their own terms, he seemingly lost according to their terms. But this was the peace of Christ. Rome put people on the cross to bear the weight of the peace. For Rome, peace really was not the peace for the whole world, but a peace for Romans and those who were participating. Peace was something that that if you were joined in with this mission of Rome, that you were going to have this peace, and if anyone got in the way of it, they were going to suffer for it. If you got in the way of the ruling people's experience of peace, you were going to bear the weight. Jesus and those who follow him, however, face the cross for themselves, obligating themselves to a new way of being, not obligating others to suffer so that our life is more bearable. 
They take the weight on themselves, not make others take the weight on. Rome made other people bear the weight of peace so that they could enjoy the peace. Pax Romana is thus limited to some. The peace of Rome is ne can never be for everyone because some people have to be restricted or opposed in order to keep this kind of peace active. Pax Christi is for all, together. Christ bears the weight for such peace. If such peace insists that others bear the weight for it, that's the peace of Rome. If a certain peace requires people groups to be broken or damaged or dominated, to be dismissed as people, to be dehumanized, that is not the peace of Christ. That is the peace of Rome. Christ bears the weight of the peace on the cross, and so we offer a peace that is for everyone, for everyone altogether. Theology of cross confronts issues of guilt and oppression and blame because oppression can never be justified through assertion of the law of Christ. Again, the peace of Christ is offered to all through the sacrifice of Jesus. So you can never justify oppression saying that you are oppressing for the sake of peace, that you are oppressing for the sake of the better good, that you are oppressing for the sake of your own comfort or values. Jesus himself took on the oppression. Jesus himself was among the oppressed. And the peace he offers is not one that is ever applied through oppression. By asserting the place of grace as the formative law, Jesus takes on the blame of those who he would forgive. Even the people who are guilty of the sins that, they've, that, they, that they have performed. And especially those who are not guilty of their own sins, but guilty seemingly for some context they're in, or for some historical event, or something their ancestors did. Jesus does not allow us to, to blame people for their own suffering, to blame people for their own impression, because in the cross, Jesus takes on this blame. Jesus takes on the weight of this peace so that he offers grace and forgives those so they're not oppressed because of their sins and guilt. Those who seek to represent God then are put in the position of blaming God for including those who should be righteously excluded. If we want to represent God, we cannot play the same role as God. People who like to represent God, like the Jewish leaders, like Rome itself in a lot of ways, thought they were right, being righteous in excluding or dismissing or oppressing. They thought there are people who belong and people who don't belong. They thought there is an order to society in which some are righteously suffering for their sins. But if it, God includes those people, then we're not really blaming those people if we try to justify oppression or suffering. We're blaming God because God's taken on this blame, so we can't blame people without ourselves blaming God and his choice and his role. If we accuse people of guilt for which God has forgiven them, we're accusing the forgiver. We're accusing the one who has taken away their guilt, who has died for their sins. Jesus takes the blame. Jesus himself takes the blame as he takes responsibility for such people. Jesus himself took on the guilt. Jesus himself took on the oppression. Jesus himself took on the blame because he said these Rome, the religious leaders, the zealots, they don't have the ability to judge righteously and God himself is going to step in and proclaim a new system, a new way of being. So the cross confronts us with this choice and only this choice. There is no middle ground. Are we with Jesus and those he is with on the cross? Are we willing to forsake forms of identity defined by the religious leaders or powers like Rome or powers like the zealots? Are we willing to put aside forms of identity that seek to establish ourselves as our own powers in contrast or dominating others? Are we with Jesus or are we against Jesus and with those who put Jesus on the cross? Because even if we talk a lot about Jesus for our own sins, so, so many of us in our lives, in our assumptions, in our patterns, in the structures we're a part of, are participating in ways, in the very ways that led to Jesus' crucifixion. And, and we're participating in forms of oppression and domination that are very much similar to the kind of people who put Jesus on the cross. So are we with Jesus and those he is with, or are we against Jesus and with those who put Jesus on the cross? That's the confrontation on the cross that faces us today and every single day.